seven years in this home church where I have been pastor here for about three years. I have yet to preach a passage like this, by the way, here. And anyone else that would have seen me in any other context would have probably said of me that that was out of character. getting there. Um, so, anyway, got everything set up, we're ready to record, and we're good to go. <laughs> um, in that seven years, if you would have been to any of one of my first three years of sermons, uh, my first sermon series was teaching you through the Sermon on the Mount, by the way, um, people would say things like, I, I used to get people to come up to me and say, you're one of those fire and brimstone preachers. <laughs> My son, this is just he walked in, so we'll speak of him a little bit. Actually, was sent away to he's going into the military. I asked him, I said, Will you listen to this message from Paul Washer? He said, Son, he said, Dad, are you kidding me? You are Paul Washer. I've <laughs> 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 heard it, I've heard it, I'm good. And so people would say, um, One of my wife's friends was at the house one time, and she's I just don't like fire and brimstone preachers. And um, I looked at my wife and I was like, I said, like, if you're that way, I'm not really a fire and brimstone preacher. She said, well, she said, sometimes. I said, well, sometimes there's fire and brimstone in the passage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just preach the word. And she's like, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's not a lot of people doing that. <laughs> so um, today is one of those passages. Mm -hmm. R.C. Sproul recently wrote, wrote a book called Hard Sayings. This is one of them. Mm -hmm. There are two types of hard sayings in that book of R.C. Sproul. Some are just hard to comprehend, hard to grab what's being said in the text. This is not one of those passages. In fact, it's quite clear that when we read this passage on its face, you're going to understand every word there. Mm -hmm. We're just going to say, does it really say that? Does it really mean that? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, yes. It really does. And yes, he really does. Let's turn to our passage today. We're turning to Hebrews 10. We're continuing on in our series through Hebrews. I'm going to pick up where we left off last time, verses 24 following to 31. Our principal passage, teaching passage today, is going to be 26 through 31. Here's the word of the Lord. For let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning willingly, sinning willingly, after receiving a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severe punishment do you think 
will be deserved for who has trampled under foot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant which he has sanctified, which he was sanctified, and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of the God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, indeed, in these passages, there are some strong words and a terrible warning, both to your people and to those who stand outside looking in. Let the words of this morning be and capture the hearts of people that they would run and flee to Christ for mercy and receive grace that alone is offered in me for salvation forever and ever to the ends of the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these words. Amen. Amen. I want to say the context of this book particularly, but specifically this passage, is written to one group of people and two types of people, and is delivered as a two-type message. We're going to see that as we go through the passage. It is written to Hebrew Christians, or at least that community body which called themselves Hebrew Christians. It's a two-type warning. What I mean by two-type warning is it is speaking to Christians. It's a warning to Christians that are truly Christians. Saying, stay in the path. Keep on the step. Keep clinging to Christ. And it's also written to a group of people that are in that same community group. They are clinging to life told themselves that they believe it. They may even think that they believe it. They don't. They're trusting in non-truths. They put their hope in a false gospel, and they're just hoping to write it out with everyone else, thinking that we are all in the same group, and we're all going to the same place. And that, my friend, is an absolute lie. There is one community here. It is the covenant group of God's People. But in that covenant community, there are those who are covenant members by faith and those who have really given no faith to be part of the everlasting covenant. So this is a two-part warning. This is a warning to those who are believing in a false gospel to say, listen, there is a There's a warning for those who are truly in the covenant family. Keep on persevering. Keep on clinging on the Savior. When I was thinking, when I was writing this all up, I was thinking, my title of What Are You Trusting In? Uh, one idea came to mind, one real story, kind of recently, at least in the, the era of 2000, came to my grasp and I thought of Bernie Madoff. <laughs> Maybe you've heard of him. <laughs> He's a stock security scandal guy who started his scandal back in 1992. You wouldn't have heard of him then. He was considered to be one of the best securities and investment firm guys out there. Although the SEC, since 1992, has had tips and has sought to investigate him six different times between 1992 and 2008. And yet they found no credible evidence to convict him, to bring charges against a guy who, through the course of his investment career, invested funds in over 64 billion with a B dollars. A 
want you to hear what I say. There was one man in charge of the flow of $64 billion through a course of probably 20 years. And in this time frame, there were people that were investing with him. And I'm not talking about people like me or you. I'm talking like people like the top 2% that live on Palm Beach Island, a lot of them, a lot of companies, a lot of mega corporations, even oil companies in the Persian Gulf and in Saudi Arabia had investments with Roberto Mino. He had investments from Palm Beach all the way to the Persian Gulf and had clients of multi-tier industry and clients of just multi-tier wealth and singular names. He had people all up and down the spectrum of the super rich. And his, it, it's, it's funny, but his, his call to them was not, I'm going to make you super rich. His punchline to them was, listen, I am going to give you consistent return no matter what happens in any way. You will get a consistent return from me. And there were people with him for 20 years that believed that's exactly what he was doing. That he, they, they, they were putting in their money and they were getting back not great returns, but good returns. I mean, it was a down market here, a down market here. There were bad situations, there were fluctuations. There was the, you know, the 9 11 thing happened and, and stuff, but they actually succeeded through a lot of that. Things were going well. And then when the when we had the crash in 08 of the housing market, investors started pulling out hundreds of millions of dollars from Bernie Madoff's bank of money that he had, and it became apparent fairly quickly that he lacked the resources to support the financial picture that he had out there on paper. Many people lost everything that they had. Now we're not talking about people that are living paycheck to paycheck. We're talking multi-millionaires. Woke up the next day and they were dead broke. They went to bed worth 20 plus million and woke up the next day homeless. Homeless. Bernie Madoff was convicted, and only a small portion of that money was ever recovered and sent back to those who were believing that they were investing all of their wealth or a good portion of their wealth in a trustworthy place. And they found that it was all built on a line. all collapsed and there was nothing there. But the retirement is destitute. Homes, and companies, and cars that are absolutely foreclosed on a confiscated. Everything that you have is being taken away. And this lifestyle that you've lived for the last 15 years, you're going to have to go and get or whatever, you're going to have to survive. Led to a lot of health conditions, and led to a lot of suicides. Led to a lot of people, the bubble bursting. That's what we're talking about here. This message is on four costs of trusting a, a false gospel. You may think, well, I'm, I'm just like them. I'm sitting in the same room. I'm in the same community. We're all going through the same stuff. But when the house of cards collapse, there's an everlasting life coming. But it might not be the one you expect. It might not be anything left. But like it says here,
nothing but a fearful expectation of a fury of fire which consumes the adversary. Nothing. Everlasting flame. Today we're looking at four costs of trusting in a false gospel. Four costs of trusting in a false gospel. First, a complete disregard for sin. Trusting in a false gospel, there's a complete disregard for sin. We see this in verse 26 and 27. For if we go on sinning, sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. I know you've heard Brian talk about this. It comes from Numbers 15.30. It's called sinning with a high hand. Mm -hmm. It's how the Old Testament describes it. It's sinning with disregard. Like if you go out and sin, you just don't care. Whatever. I still, I lie, I cheat. Who cares? I don't. Numbers 15.30, but the person who does anything with a high hand with disregard, whether he is a native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people. Numbers 15.30. That's anyone in the community of Israel that sins flippantly. And it doesn't matter if you're a community member, a slave, a volunteer, just someone that's inside the walls. What is this sinning deliberately? In one sense, in one sense, I want to be honest with you, all sin is deliberate. Who here? Has sinned and was like, didn't want to do that. <laughs> Did it anyway. <laughs> I was trying not to, but I, I, I slipped no. and it came out. No. No, that, that's not what's happening. Something comes up at work. Are you sick today? Have you been tested? Sure. Well, you look sick. You need to go home. <laughs> you know you weren't tested. <laughs> but you're unsure of how the boss will take that kind of information after she just plainly asked you. But that's not the passage is talking about. You didn't want to sin, but sometimes you sin inadvertently, and you don't desire to sin. Your heart is, I don't want to sin. The question of Christianity is not whether you sin or not sin. If that was the question, none of us would be Christians. If that was the question, no human would be a Christian. The question is, are you in a position of false Paul in Romans 7. The sin I don't want to do, I do. And the good thing I want to do, I just don't do. See, your heart's in it. But sometimes your actions are it. That's the response of a Christian. I'm going to feel like I want to do the right thing. All right, I remember hearing Adrian Rogers say, I sin all I want to. In fact, I sin more than I want to. Because I don't want to. Sometimes I sin. That is the attitude of a Christian. And some of us sin. Did you sin? I don't know. I mean, you don't know. <laughs> Whatever. <coughs> yes, I might have. The question is this. Do you have such a low regard for sin that you don't, you don't even care? Your desire isn't. 
living according to him. That's what it's talking about here. And when you go on sinning willfully, this is a word in the aorist purpose. It's in the aorist perfect active tense. What it means is it's an ongoing process. You go on willfully sinning. If that is your life, if that's the way that you live, this is that attitude of apostasy. Yes. But guess what? I've walked up the aisle. <laughs> I've said that I, I trust in Jesus. I, I'm good. <laughs> I remember one of the first guys I disciple. And we were sitting down. And he looked at me. And he said, Pastor Mark, Pastor Mark, it's okay. It's okay. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What do you mean it's okay? He says, I've been watching TV now. And I don't know those car Christians. <laughs> Please, if you have seen this on TV, there's no truth to the statement of Carmel Christian. I said, trusting in a false gospel, there is a disregard for sin. There's a book written by a doctor and a professor of theology out of Dallas Theological Seminary. His name is Zane Hodges. I would not recommend this book to read on how you should be a Christian. It's called Absolutely Free. In this book, he says, as long as you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't ever have to receive him as Lord or be his disciple. In fact, if you received him as Savior, you could go on sinning to the point of committing capital crimes because having Jesus as Lord does not mean you have to have him as Lord over your heart. You can have him just as Savior. John MacArthur is going to write a book actually refuting this entire argument called The Gospel According to Jesus. It's a refute of that book by Zane Hodges on Lordship Salvation, saying if you don't have Jesus as Lord, he is not your Savior. Amen. You have misinterpreted passages. You can't receive him as Savior only. He is 
either as Lord or he has no relationship to you. Why? Because it is the sin that he's taking you out of that is part of making you holy. That's part of making you who you were meant to be. The knowledge of the truth. It says here in 27, 26, if you go on sinning deliberately after receiving a knowledge of the truth, this word in Greek is epigenosis, a full knowledge as you were, or a super knowledge of truth. So this is not talking about a Christian who day one comes into the kingdom and he's expected to know everything in the scriptures. <laughs> but this is saying one who has understood and grasped plainly the truth of scripture goes on sinning there remains no place for forgiveness in him. Or no place for atonement for his sin. What the passage actually says, there remains no sacrifice for him. So if you've read it and you know it, and I've got it all. I just don't care. I have Jesus as Savior, but I have myself as Lord. There remains no sacrifice. This knowledge of truth is only going to do one thing, and that is to bring condemnation. And then it says, but if you knowingly sin, after receiving the knowledge of truth, there remains no sacrifice of sin but a terrifying expectation of judgment and a fury of fire which will consume the adversary. I would say that there's a fire of judgment that is coming to those who have this practice of disregard for sin. But while you live, it could be a fire of correction. There remains for you yet a hope. If you are breathing, the reason why this message is given today is to warn you that there is hope. It says in 1 Peter 4, 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. The idea here is, is, is the Lord is bringing things into your life that are hard, that are painful. There are struggles. But it's sometimes these struggles that will bring life to you. It's sometimes <laughs> sometimes these struggles that will bring you faithful hands of the gospel. You see, if you're trusting in a lot, the welcome of the hands of the Savior that says, I know. No, you're not believing in the truth. The truth is still here to love you. I am still here to love you. I want you to know that there's two sides to this message for both ends. Maybe as a Christian, you've been on the edges. And the Lord is saying to you, love me like you did at first. Understand that the things I ask of you is not for your hurt, but for your help. See sin as the very thing that's killing you, not the God who's loved.
and to walk away from that life, whether you choose to acknowledge or not, that is killing you. And you want to grasp it, and you want to hold it, and you want to pet it. But at the end of the day, it's a lion, and it will eat you. It comes with a dastardly cost. And you can't see it until it's too late. The second cost of trusting a false gospel is a complete disregard for the law of Christ. You see this in 28 and 29. And anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant which he was sanctified. Disregard the law of Christ. If you consider Deuteronomy 17.6, this is actually the passage where this comes out of, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, the one who, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. And this is that person in Israel that worships the false God. That worships the God. That trusts no longer in Yahweh. That trusts no longer in the God that brought them out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land, but says, no, I'm going to put up the Asherah pole. I'm going to take my children to Moloch and offer them up. This did happen in Israel, by the way, if you've if you read through the history, quite often. But they were supposed to be executed on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Anyone who has the law, why? Just read through Judges. Read through Judges. Here's the story of Judges, and it's in a cycle of 16 sections. The people come in. They have prosperity. They turn away from God. God raises up an enemy to attack them. They cry out to God. God sends a deliverer. They thank God. They live for God. They have prosperity. They turn away from God. God raises up an enemy. They come against the people of God. God raises up a deliverer. What is that telling you? When we have prosperity, we turn away from God. And God says, well, okay, I've got to send something in their way so they know you're still dying. Even if it feels good to you. You're still going to suffer. So he sends an enemy. And they cry out. We need your help. Okay, just deliver her. And he helps. And they thank God. Thank you, Lord, for helping us. Yes. And then prosperity comes. And we turn away from God. <laughs> I mean, that quickly. We, do. We, we cannot handle being comfortable. <laughs> That's the testimony of Scripture. Why? Because when we are comfortable, we trust in us. Yep. And God says, stop being stupid. You've never been able to do this. <laughs> and well, I think I, I can. And that's why you need fiery trials. Because you're absolutely wrong. If you think you can do this, you miss the message of Scripture. The message of Scripture are the faithful look in the mirror and they say, I can't do this. I need you, Jesus. Not for salvation. For everything. You will be my God and I will be your people. I'm trusting in you. The least to the greater is the argument here. He tells them, don't you see? Don't 
don't you see that even in the law of Moses, under the testimony of two or three people, you are condemned to death. The law of Christ? Do you think you're going to fare better to disregard his law? I want to read to you 1 John 2, 3, and 4. I hope you have this memorized. You should. Or circle this under your scriptures if you don't have it memorized. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. The truth is not in him. That's the one passage. I mean, can you find that one place in the Bible you got to circle in that? How about the Great Commission? Matthew 28, 19. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And what? Teaching them what? To observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Is he saying that we have to do everything that he commanded? He absolutely is. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do we do that? Lo, I am with you. Telling you to try harder and to put your bootstraps on and to just grin it and dig it. <laughs> He's telling you to realize you can't do it. Go to the one who always could. The life of Christianity is not making a perfection that Jesus is Lord. The life of Christianity is living the life of Jesus as Lord. It's waking up every day and saying, I need you. Amen. I can't do this. Without you, I'm an absolute failure. It's all going to fall apart unless you do it. Because I can't do it. And he's like, July 4th just passed. We celebrate Independence Day. Christians should celebrate American Independence Day, but we should celebrate Dependence Day. <laughs> when you were born again, you were born again to Dependence Day. <laughs> this is the day where I recognize I have a daily dependence on Jesus. Amen. Christianity is not coming to church on Sunday. It's not coming Wednesday night. It's not coming Sunday night. It's every day saying, Jesus, I need you. Christianity is not you making a testimony or profession that I trust in Jesus. Hear what I'm saying? If you don't live for Jesus today, tomorrow, the next day, never live for Jesus.
Brian spoke of it earlier in our Bible study. I don't understand, man. You know, I do what I think is right. There's a way to see me right now, man. I mean that that is church. If the beginning of Christianity is nothing else, it needs to be this. changing the truth. Mm -hmm. It's just changing your place in that truth. God has offered you amazing grace. Will you set it aside for the foolishness of this world? Number three. The first cause of trusting a false gospel is complete disregard for sin. Second, the cost of trusting a false gospel is a disregard for the law of Christ. The fourth, the third cost of trusting in a false gospel is disregard for the blood of God. It says here in verse 30. severe punishment do you think will be deserved who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and is regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace. I'm going to talk about unclean, unholy, and common. It's the same word clone. It's actually where we get the word if you go to take Biblical Greek, you'll take Kone Greek. That's because you're not taking scholarly Greek. You're not taking philosopher Greek. You're taking the common tongue Greek. Kids Greek, basically. Which is technique, but anyway. Kone means common. And the idea here is you have taken the blood of Christ and made it made it something that is to be disregarded. Mm -hmm. If you can go on living, not caring about this Savior and completely disregarding everything that he said, disregarding the law that he's called you to, disregarding his call to you to be united to him, that he can guide and direct and minister your life. known to you. A gospel has been given to you, and yet if you won't receive it, if you won't take it, then you have made common the blood of Christ spilled on behalf of those who believe in Jesus. You have disregarded the blood of the atonement. Sanctify it. I want you to see here, it actually says in the passage, and as regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he, he was sanctified. Who's the he there? It's the 
he's the person who's talking about. It's not Jesus. And we said this is a two-part passage. It's talking to two different people. It's talking to an unsaved people, and it's talking to a saved people. Are we saying that there are people that are sanctified, that are made unholy? Well, in a sense, yes. Because the word sanctified can have two meanings as well. Mm -hmm. It can be mean to be made holy. It can also be mean to be pulled away into a group, set apart. to a covenant group. You have been set apart from the big group into a little group. So whether you're on the side of this where I have, I'm part of a Bible community, you have been sanctified, in a sense. Even though you're not a saved person losing your salvation, you are a covenant person that has not really fully embraced that covenant home. And therefore, you have made filthy a blood that has sanctified you. <coughs> and in this sense, what it's actually talking about is you have disregarded your baptism. You have seen your baptism as something not effective to you as something not having any meaning or purpose for you other than you got wet one day. <laughs> it's had no effect for you. It's had no hope for you or any help for you. Don't disregard. Don't disregard the blood that has sanctified you. And you have insulted and outraged the Spirit of God. says here, in my, in my version, who has insulted the spirit of grace. That word that's used there in the Greek could be outraged, could be insulted, could be disregarded. could have a lot of semantic meanings, but the here and now of this passage and where it's placed in context, it's you spit in the face of the spirit of Let's say in Ephesians 4 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, yet you have taken this place to such a point that you have insulted. disregarded the third person of the Trinity. This is the omniscient, almighty, living God. And you're treating him as a punk. <laughs> uh, you not. Disregard the blood of the atonement. You disregard the promise of that blood in your baptism. You say, yeah, yeah, I can pray. I got this. You don't have anything. I don't have anything. We believe these lies. We think we have control over things. I say, I know what's going to happen next week. I have no clue what's going to happen in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> I am living on grace and Jesus. That's it. I could fall right now. And so could you. What kind of presumption tells you that you have a lot more than others? Let the Spirit of God has let you open the word of God receive that gift. The living God has disregarded your slanderous nature for him. And I said, I will receive the energy. Just trust in me. I will carry you where you cannot go. 
come last. The fourth cost of believing the false gospel is the punishment. Starting in 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And I have three passages for you. But I want you to turn and look at all of them. Deuteronomy 4 24. Speaking of this, it says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. It's the nature of of the God that we are insulting. Look at Deuteronomy 32, 35. This is an almost an exact quote from here. It says, Vengeance is mine. I will recompense for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and their doom comes swiftly. He speaks here of those who are entering into in this passage, he says, there is a day coming where they will no longer consider prosperity as what they can see. But their doom is coming, and they will receive absolute judgment for their unbelief. Romans 12 actually picks up the same passage. And what does Romans 12 say? Romans 12 says when something bad happens to you, when someone disregards you, they cut in front of you in traffic, when somebody is walking next to you, they bump you, when somebody picks up a stick and just hits you square in the back, <laughs> don't hit them! Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, said the Lord. So I'm talking about this section here as punishment for believing the false gospel is God will come to collect. These, you, there has been an occasion where you have disregarded a believer or one who has trusted in the gospel. The payment's coming. God says, I will recompense. I will repay. So my question to you, if you're outside the kingdom, are you ready for the debt to come to collection? Second, God will judge. This is both. I want you to see this as those outside the kingdom and those inside the kingdom. It says here in Amos 2, 3, 2. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. It's talking about Israel. And it says, therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. This is not a punishment unto judgment. This is a punishment unto salvation. Amos is telling them God is coming, and he's going to bring punishment to you so that you might receive grace. Why? Because you foolishly walk in arrogance, thinking that you have grace. And you don't. You have bought the lie. Before I go further, I want to say... I am saying something, and I'm not saying something. What am I saying? I'm not saying that if you do everything the Scripture says, and if you walk according to every law that I've ever seen in Scripture, and I love Jesus, and all these things, that I'm going to be saved. I'm not saying that. I'm saying those will decide to walk in the manner of the Amen. That will love the way he desires for you. That will know that the one you are to trust is no man, no person, no pastor as, as much as he 
doesn't exposit the scriptures. Trust Christ. Trust the one who does save. Trust the one who continues to save. And in that, you will find freedom. But if you won't receive that, God will punish you. Isaiah 66, 24. This is talking about the end of time. At the end of judgment. And they will go out and look at the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. For their worms shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be in abhorrence to all of them. I'll talk about this at least. This last portion of the end of this book by Jonathan Edwards on this passage. That phrase, their worms shall not die and their fire shall not be quenched is an, is an evidence of the ongoing torment of those who die in judgment. Their worms shall not die is the idea that they shall be eaten from within all the days of their life without end and without mercy. The worm shall not die means, first of all, you'll never be completely eaten up from the inside, but it'll go on continuing to that fire that will not be quenched means you have a lot of stuff to burn, but not so to the point that the fuel will run out. You will continue to burn. And are those figures of speech? They absolutely are. But what could they possibly be figures of? But anything but inter and outer, current and absolute punishment. That's what awaits all those who are enemies of the living King and the living God. That who by grace has brought you here with living breath can come to me and I will not receive you as a slave, but as a son and as a daughter. You will receive blessings beyond that. For no eye has seen, or ears heard, or mind has even imagined the blessings that I have prepared for those. Amen. See, as bad as the other side is, the grace on the other side is so much sweeter. Jonathan Edwards, who had, of the fame you might have heard of, sinner in the hands of an angry God, wrote this about this passage. Why should a worm think of supporting himself against an omnipotent adversary? Consider God has made your soul, and he can fill it with misery. Made your body, and he can bring what torments he will upon it. God who made you has given you a capacity to bear torment, and he has that capacity in his hands. How dreadful must it be to fall in the hands of such a man. Mm. That's what this passage says. That's a colloquial statement, by the way, in the first century. To fall in the hands of the living God is actually to be handed over to your enemy's judgment. Mm -hmm. It's actually what that statement means. So it is always a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a uh, living God because he is an enemy that can punish absolutely. Mm. And it's absolutely righteous. Mm. It's also, he's also the living God that says today that he will not harden your heart mm. and come to me. I will be sick as a child. Amen. Careful. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your mercy and your kindness mm -hmm. for us. We do know that there are hard passages in Scripture that we are thankful for the grace and the kindness of you that offer us alone in Christ. Let that be the fixed 